uh, Hamid Al Hamid Al Mohammed, um, who is uh, the chief data science scientist and executive director at Radiant Earth Foundation. He has extensive experience in machine learning, remote sensing, and imagery techniques. Uh, he serves on the technical advisory boards of L Lacuna Fund and enabling uh, corp analytics at scale, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation initiative. Hello. Hi, Rob. How are you? How is your foster G going? It was great so far. Yeah. That's awesome. So yeah, we've um, we've had a lot of talks uh, this track around um, you know different utilizing different types of data. Um, uh, different access patterns to that data, uh, you know, open science and how we can apply sort of different analytic techniques. And then uh, in the recent couple of talks, you know, how to how to go that last mile and and work on applications. So I'd love to, you know, hit on any of that um, that you'd be interested in. But uh, first of all, I just want to I just want to kind of uh, ask you about yourself and, and, and ask you, like, how you um, got into uh, Geospatial, open source, and remote uh, and Earth's observation in, in the first place. Uh, good question. First of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, and uh, amazing track today with the with the Microsoft AI program. So really enjoyed uh, uh, all of the talks today. Uh, for me, so it was during my master's study back in like. 2007, I would say. Um, I was interested to work on a research problem during my master's related to climate change. I was really uh, reading a lot about climate change, how it's going to impact us. Uh, first time I was seeing a lot of impacts from droughts, environment around me. And I was reading a lot of literature. And I remember one of the key ones was a workshop report from WCRP, which is the World Climate Research Program. Uh, and this was talking about how you can use a satellite called GRACE uh, which is gravity recovery and climate experiment to monitor terrestrial water, how okay. snowpacks are changing, how groundwater is changing, and how that impacts on sea level rise. Um, and being in love of the space, uh, everything is space, from rockets, satellites, and everything, I was like, okay, I'm going to combine these two and work on this problem as a kind of a master's thesis project. Uh, and that got me started. Uh, the rest is really, really history, but that was really the, the motivating point, the intersection of my interest in the space and climate change that uh, that report was really, I think, pivotal. Awesome, yeah. And so that led you to uh, to Radiant Earth, and uh, yeah, how did you get involved with uh, the Radiant Earth Foundation? Uh, yeah, so I mean, so after that, I did my PhD. I was doing even more uh, with remote sensing and a lot of open source uh, kind of data sets and, and tools. And then gradually, with the kind of developments of machine learning, I also got interested in oh, how can we apply those techniques to these data? So. After uh, kind of finishing my degree, I was looking for an organization to kind of be at the intersection of these three pieces, which is the earth observation, the machine learning, and using this for global challenges. So it's it's will be more an applied kind of organization than a research organization. Um, and I came across a profile from Radian in one of the articles again at that time and got very fascinated by their mission and vision, uh, which was we have these all open data as we talk about it. But still, it is not free in the sense that you need you need resources, you need tools, you need skill sets to be able to consume that open data. Uh, and Radian was about how can we solve this problem for users, particularly those uh, across the global development sector, those who would benefit the most from this because of the uh, basically higher gap that they have to access these data. Uh, and that was the time I was like, okay, well, let, let, let's see if I can join this organization. And they didn't have any open position. Uh, but I took the took the opportunity and messaged the CEO back then, and uh, then it got started, and then I joined Radian about uh, two months after. This was in 2017. Uh, yeah, and I joined as a senior data scientist at that time. Very cool. Now you find yourself as the director, um, and it's an amazing organization. So uh, if you could talk a little bit about what Radian Earth is and, and what its uh, mission is and what the goals are. Uh, yeah, so Radian is a nonprofit organization. Uh, the, the vision and the mission is to really empower individuals and organizations uh, to better use advancements in machine learning techniques on Earth observation and address many of these global development challenges from uh, uh, climate change, uh, sustainability issues, conservation practices, agricultural productivity, and many, many others that are all related and very much intertwined. Um, and we do this uh, through a pillar of uh, kind of activities, which include working on producing many of the benchmark data sets that are needed for machine learning applications. Uh, we are also now starting to work on models and publishing them. 
And we have an open repository called Radian ML Hub that users can uh, access these data openly and easily. Uh, secondly, we work with community. Uh, we feel as our uh, uh, kind of as a neutral agency, we have this uh, capacity to bring the community together and work on many standards and best practices uh, that would then facilitate this uh, advancements in the ecosystem. Uh, and third, uh, working on capacity development and training. Uh, we feel there is there is a significant need again to not just provide the tooling, but also the know-how, the knowledge, and the best practices to end users, to stakeholders on the ground. Uh, and we do this through a series of trainings, boot camps, running competitions on the data, uh, and also working closely with the stakeholders on the ground. Awesome. Yeah, it's great work. And uh, my engagement with, with Radio North has been a lot through the, the stack uh, specification, um, which, uh, you know, since its start, Radio has been a proponent of and hosts uh, the GitHub repositories. So yeah, I guess, um, can you talk a little bit about um, what Stack is meant for the uh, geospatial ecosystem's ability to access data and how reading uh, is playing a part in that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, you might remember this, the first time you and I met was around the state of the map US in 2017. And that was when we had our first Stack Sprint yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in, in Boulder, Colorado. So yeah, it's, it's almost four years since then. Uh, so Stack, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar, it's a spatiotemporal asset catalog. Uh, so it's an open specification for how you basically uh, list the metadata of your geospatial assets uh, and serve them, uh, whether it's an open-facing API for your users uh, and customers, or it's a like internal database uh, within a company or an organization. Uh, the, the problem that Stack tries to address, and uh, we believe it has address now because there's a significant adoption is and a standard way that everybody can access in terms of first searching for data and then accessing, meaning downloading and retrieving the data of geospatial data. Uh, before Stack, uh, every platform, every tool, every organization had their own way of cataloging their data, how they define, for example, geospatial bounds, how they define cloud cover, uh, and many other properties of the, the asset. Uh, but now with the Stack, there is a consensus and there's a standardization how you define those, so everybody does that uh, in the same way. So for end users, this is very much easy because they can use a um, standard pipeline and API to retrieve data sets from multiple providers and organizations. Uh, and the key thing about the stack is it is developed by the community. So it is not one organization uh, like Radiant sitting down and saying, okay, this is the standard. It was really bringing and convening all the providers and users throughout these four years with the sprints, uh, GitHub tickets, uh, a lot of uh, check-in weekly meetings and things like that including yourself, you have been part of that, uh, to come up with this specification. And the 1.0 was released uh, July of this year after I think about six or seven iterations before that. Uh, so, and Radian was really the convener here. Uh, we acted as an organization that identified this problem, was interested to uh, basically coalesce everybody around this solution. Um, and we did this through what we call a technology fellowship program. Uh, so we established this fellowship program about four years ago with the establishment of actually SAC uh, to bring on board uh, uh, people from the community who are working somewhere else, but they're interested to work part time on a like open source project or tooling. Uh, and they would work on the different aspects of the stack. You, you have been one of that in the past. Uh, so uh, we have been able and fortunate to bring many talented people to that ecosystem through that program and definitely many other sponsors and uh, contributors, including Microsoft, uh, Planet, and many others. Uh, so yeah, th that is what is the stack about, and we look forward to a much larger ecosystem of uh, providers and users who are using stack. Yeah, for sure. And you, you say four years ago was the first sprint. It's crazy that that feels long ago, but also feels <laughs> like a very short time to, to get to where stack is today. Uh, so it's pretty amazing. And yeah, it's, you know, we've made a lot of progress. Um, but yeah, I'm interested in your thoughts on what's next for Stack. We, we, we released 1.0. There's data sets that are being, um, you know, utilizing Stack to encode that, the metadata. Uh, where do you see things heading uh, from here? I think the next systems will be uh, under ecosystem, meaning tools and packages that would help users adopt the Stack whether it's about how to generate your Stack catalog and put it out or how to consume those data that are using Stack. Uh, there are many packages. We just had the Stack talk actually before, before this. Uh, Matt Hansen and uh, Chris Holmes were talking about the state of Stack. And you see a lot of uh, uh, kind of 
packages and tools being developed. Uh, but I think that the next kind of couple of years will be an explosion of those. We are going to see a much more diverse tooling, not just with like Python, but with many other like programming languages that people uh, can consume stack. And then a lot of applications is going to be built on top of these catalogs to consume the data, whether it's about how to read a whole catalog into your, I don't know, a NumPy array in Python, how to read that scalably, how to combine that with Dask and other kind of uh, scalable solutions for reading huge data sets and doing analytics on them, or for visualizations, uh, how you can consume a cloud native data, which is a uh, catalog with the stack and then serving that through visualization dashboards for users. So we are gonna see, um, I think an explosion on both sides, the tooling uh, and also the applications and consumer side. Uh, and definitely more intertwined with other things like how to do machine learning, how to do models and things like that. But the stack itself, I think that's how it's gonna expand in the next couple of years. Yeah, for sure. It's it's uh, interesting to kind of think of where stack is and that it really is just kind of a beginning. Um, you know, cataloging the data efficiently was is the start of a series of processes um, that honestly, I think all could use the same type of you know, template of creating a community driven standard like, um, like stack, you know, has, mm -hmm. has, uh, done. So that sort of brings me to the next, you know, stage of use utilizing the data. We know where it is. We know its location. Mm -hmm. We know the metadata and now we want to develop models against it. And I know that, uh, Raiden Earth is doing a lot of really awesome sort of development around a specification for models. So can you, uh, talk about that a bit? Yeah, uh, as you said, uh, really the key piece is really putting this data into action. Uh, I mean, the, the data and the imagery are not the solution. They are the problem, actually, right? So we, we just have that. Now, now the solution is now, OK, what is the insight that I'm going to derive from that and how it's going to impact the decision on the ground, the policymaker, the decision maker, and the end user? Uh, so in that sense, there, we see also a lot of, uh, and we have seen a lot of talks in this conference as well, applications of machine learning on these uh, data sets uh, the missing piece that, again, we, we try to identify those and kind of focus our energy and our effort on that is how can now we catalog machine learning models? And let me say, first answer, why do we need that? Uh, we, we need that for the reasons of search and uh, kind of discovery. If I'm coming, for example, to a domain of land cover classification and I'm interested in using Sentinel-2 imagery, how can I search for existing machine learning models that can do that? and then have a way of benchmarking them, looking at their performance, and then deciding whether it's addressing my need or I should go and develop a new model myself. So that is a key piece that we don't have now. We should go search probably research papers, a lot of GitHub repositories, maybe some tweets from someone to figure out what is out there. And then when you find something, how can you go after reproducing and reusing that? Uh, so making sure the metadata is very well captured. Metadata in this case might mean what was the runtime? Uh, what was the exact training data that you used? How did you do the train test split in the data? How did you derive your features? Uh, and then how did you train the model? And then post of that, what was the performance metric? Uh, depending on the problem, you might be looking at, I don't know, IOU, F1 score, any of those metrics. Um, and being able to capture this in a machine readable metadata uh, would enable that search and discovery, as well as the automation of reproducibility and reusability. So users can easily say, oh, this is the machine that I need. This is the Docker image, for example, I need to have to run this model and like do inference in a larger scale at a continental level, for example, if the model is applicable. So what we are working on is that metadata specification. Uh, uh, we are currently calling it Geospatial Machine Learning Model Catalog, uh, abbreviated as GMLMC. I know it's not as fancy as a stack, but <laughs> we'll, we will get there. Uh, if you have any suggestions for name, you're welcome to join. Uh, you can find the GMLMC repo on our GitHub. Uh, our GitHub is Radiant Earth, uh, and you will see uh, the draft version of that. Uh, we actually had a hackathon about two weeks ago that, uh, again, similar to the philosophy of Stack, we brought many members of the community contributing to that aspect and also starting to try it out on different models. So that will be our next uh, kind of catalog and a specification and working with the community to advance it. Very cool. Very cool. And yeah, so I know that when I was, you know, kind of starting to learn about uh, machine learning and its application to um, uh, Earth observation data, I sort of like, well, if you train a model with enough data, can it just kind of do it all the things like for a land use land cover classification model, um, wouldn't there just ideally be one that you just 
query the catalog for it's like oh here's our land use land classification model um is that uh, you know and as i've worked with machine learning i realized that there's there's problems with robustness there's there's all these things so yeah where do you see um that heading would you imagine these like uh model catalogs will be you know containing thousands of models would they be containing a few like really high performing ones yeah how do you, how do you see that playing out uh, I think actually we will have a combination of both. Uh, so we are going to have a, a set of, I would say, base models that would learn features from the input data. Let's say a model for Sentinel-2 image B. Uh, that model isn't predicting a land cover class. It's not predicting crop yield. Uh, it's not telling you whether it's water on the ground or not. It's just uh, kind of reducing the dimensionality of the image to a feature space and telling you this is what I learned from the model, from the data in a feature space. Uh, those are going to be our key and base models. And then there are going to be application models that would convert that feature space to your specific target variable, whether you're doing land cover classification or crop type mapping or any other application. Uh, and the missing piece is that base models that we don't have yet. Uh, there are some activities in the research community of Geospatial that are trying to do that. Uh, definitely capacity in terms of cloud uh, computing is helping with that because that is a massive training job that you need to do. Uh, but that, I think, will be the future of remote sensing, that uh, we have those, uh, I think in the literature, these models are now called foundation models, uh, that you're learning features from the imagery. They are not predicting anything. They're usually self-supervised. And then you convert those in a, zoo of models to your target variable or an application. Uh, that, I, I think, is, is the future of machine learning models in, in the geospatial world. Awesome. Yeah, and do you think that, you know, we, you kind of referenced a model that learned the features from Sentinel-2 data, let's say, and then that's a baseline model that you can then fine tune for your specific applications. Is there, do you, do you see an opportunity to have the models not only train against Sentinel-2, but like, a wide range of data sources? Are we going to get to the point where we have models that can actually do this type of sensor fusion, um, you know, learn across uh, uh, various data sources? Um, I think we will. Uh, yes, we will, at least, for particularly with the fusion problem, let's say Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Uh, we, we have had kind of specific examples of that working for an application, but I think at the larger scale for these foundation models, we are going to see those coming up soon. Uh, there, there is a growing need for that because everybody wants to do that. When you go to a tropical region, you can't use Sentinel-2. Uh, you want to fuse that. So the need is definitely there, and the capacity is coming up with data from the cloud and all the resources. So yes, we will see those, and I'm I'm confident machine learning can can answer that question. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I you know love ML and geospatial. So I could talk about that all day, but I wanted to kind of zoom back out and uh, sort of ask a broader question, um, sort of what this track was, you know, talking, uh, kind of addressing uh, in a large sense is, um, you know, what are, the, what are the technologies that you see today that aren't being applied uh, to their full potential to environmental sustainability work? And then what are the technologies that you see into the future um, that will be developed that uh, will address the needs of environmental sustainability work? Honestly, I feel the one that is significantly underutilized now is Earth observation. We are not using the data that we are already receiving from the satellites. Uh, just imagine Sentinel program. Uh, I mean, this is open access. You get an image every five days, everywhere on the Earth. We are not using that data. I don't think even if you look at the uh, patterns of publications, applications, projects out there, certainly there's a geographical bias. That, that's one problem. Not everywhere around the world we are utilizing the data in the same way with the same capacity. And that's why Radian is trying to do something in this ecosystem. But secondly, even in the uh, regions that we are using this, uh, I would say, at a higher rate with higher capacity, we are not utilizing it to the best. Uh, if you're thinking about how we are making decisions about conservation and environmental sustainability, imagery, satellite imagery, is not in a streamlined data in that process yet. It is more of a, let's see, we can do a pilot. I mean, some applications might be, I'm not saying nobody is doing that, but it is not the common practice. Uh, and we have all this open data, why not using that? So I think that is the technology that is underutilized these days for addressing these challenges. Uh, what will be the 
kind of future of this, uh, certainly we have more satellites coming up, uh, more modes of observation. I mean, we talk about fusion of multispectral and radar, but radar itself can be also different frequencies which would see different things on the Earth. I mean, Sentinel-1 is C-band, so usually it sees the uh, surface of vegetation, maybe a couple of centimeters of penetration to the soil. But if you go to L-band, which is uh, basically lower frequency, or P-band, which is penetrates to the soil, you can see soil moisture. You can see dynamics of that and how that interacts with weather, uh, with drought, and things like that. So we are going to see uh, more fusion of different modes of observation that would build more, I would say, inclusive and holistic models for air system monitoring. Uh, and combining those, because we are just talking about machine learning models here, combining those with physical understanding. We don't want to miss those. Uh, machine learning doesn't learn uh, energy conservation or many other things, mass balance or things like that. If you want to do these environmental monitoring, we need to bring our physical understanding to this ecosystem. Uh, and I think the future, of, the, fusion, the future of these applications will be combining machine learning with physical constraints, with physical models, and applying them to the fusion of data sets. Sounds like we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> we do. <laughs> so I'm going to look at the uh, chat for questions and um, just uh, open open the floor up for, for folks to ask questions um, while we're waiting for that. Yeah, it's interesting that that point about um, you know the various frequencies of SAR data and just like how complex that data set is and there's hyperspectral coming in all of these like you know different things that are even more complicated than imagery but you, like you said we're not even really utilizing we're not even unlocking all of the value of the data that's currently coming down from the satellite so yeah again i just think that there's a lot there's a lot of work to do to you know get even better at the stuff we're already kind of good at and then a mm -hmm. new set of com complexity coming um that we'll have to tackle in the future for sure yeah, definitely. I mean, and from, from our perspective, so we call this ecosystem that we have developed Radian ML Hub. And the hub is basically there is input and output. And they're input in the sense that we are working with as many data providers and stakeholders on the ground to bring data into the hub so people can access. But the, the kind of uh, section after us is how to consume the data. You want to have a scalable environment, open access that everybody can consume these data and build applications. And that's why we work with, with, with cloud providers. I mean, we recently, as you know very well, signed a partnership with Microsoft AI for Earth. Our vision is that the ML Hub will be an interoperable ecosystem that if someone is, for example, uh, accessing planetary computer, they can easily access training data from ML Hub, build those solutions. If you build this kind of integrated, easy to access ecosystems, then we can think about, oh, how can now people think about fusion, right? If someone wants to download those data and then try to figure it out on a, hopefully a server, uh, if not their local computer, we can think about those scalable applications. We can think about fusion problems. Uh, but if you streamline those processes, then users will be sitting on thinking about the problem and the ML model and the application, not the data access. I think our responsibility is to facilitate the data access, make it more easily uh, consumable, and then let users build the applications and solutions on the ground. Yeah, for sure. And I think that kind of speaks to the flexibility of, of stack. And I'm sure the, the sort of machine learning modeling is that uh, that linkage aspect that I don't think we're taking full advantage of yet, where that type of fusion, you know, models will be able to point back to the data sources that they were trained on, point back to the metadata about the images that they were actually, uh, that they apply to, and mm -hmm. this sort of interconnected web of both you know, the things that the planetary computer is hosting along with the ML hub data sets all kind of like connecting and working together so that we're not, you know, duplicating this, the, this, this metadata over and over again, but just, um, you know, creating a, a interconnected web. So yeah, I'm really excited to see that play out over the next set of years. Hopefully not too many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We too definitely. Do we have any questions? If not, I can, I can give a comment on the linkage thing. Yeah, uh, we actually don't have any questions, so I'll um, again encourage people uh, go ahead and ask questions. But yeah, continue. Yeah, I mean the the the, the point you mentioned about linking um, assets in the stack ecosystem, I think that that's a key piece that the stack has tried to address, and I think it has addressed actually that we we don't need to include everything in one catalog, right? When you're talking about imagery versus 
the collection of Landsat imagery. Where I'm hearing the music. Oh, I'm sorry. That's um, a ice cream truck. Maybe that was the music that somebody heard oh, earlier. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let me close my window. Apologies. <laughs> okay. Uh, and will you give us ice cream after that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I can chase it down. Your delivery gun. Yeah. So uh, the the point is, we don't need to have everything in one collection. And um, th this linkage is really trying to solve that problem. We can have, first of all, interoperable repositories. We don't need to have one repository. We are going to have data on multiple repositories on the cloud, commercial or public, or government uh, data stores. And these can be linked with the same standard in a standard catalog. So when you're hitting, for example, NASA CMR catalog, and you see a Landsat 8 scene, you know there is a link to another collection that has a training data of Landsat 8, and it's machine readable. You don't need to do that manually, right? You can hit that API, get that. If there is a property for that other collection, go and grab that training data, and then download it and build your application. That's where we see the future be with these interconnected catalogs. And then the models, as you said, are going to be linked to the actual data set, so we can have a provenance there, because that's a key piece to not, to not forget, that if I'm building a model on a specific training data, I should know as a user or a third-party user what was that source data, because that impacts the biases in the model, the uncertainties, the applicability of the model. If I trained it in a region, I don't know, in Western Kenya, for example, I can go and apply it in Chesapeake Bay in US. I should know what was that training data, what was the classes, how it was developed. Uh, so that linkage is, I think, a really key property of uh, the stack uh, specification. And hopefully, future specifications will adopt a similar strategy, basically. For sure. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the tooling ecosystem that's also coming up because, you know, we're, we're at the point where we're, we're getting the metadata together, we're extracting stack, we're building catalogs. But there's other steps of actually linking those all together and making sure that um, you know we do have the full provenance and, and all of that. So, yeah, really excited to see how that plays out. Um, no questions from the audience, uh, but it's been an amazing conversation. Uh, always love chatting with you, Ahmed. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you. And I'll sure. just I'll just close out the the Microsoft AI for Earth uh, track. Really, um, you know, appreciate all of the speakers that we've had and. Um, yeah, uh, been a, been a great foster G. So thanks a lot. And, uh, we'll, we'll see you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.